Figure this if you can. Forget the light. Forget the latest high-end laptops with the terabytes of SSD and multi -giga gigahertz processor chips. Forget even the most powerful server computer in the world today, Fugaku in Kobe, Japan, which can motor along along at 415 pentaflops, 14, 45, 40, 40, 15 thousand trillion floating points in four operations a second. All you need to be all you need to be able to compute anything is anything that it's possible to compute or now or forever in the future in a strip of paper a red or white head and a fair slice of patients. All you need in fact is a Turing machine. Alan Turing was born in Motherwell, London in 1912. And even as a young child showed signs of the genius that would probably him to become a leading light in the new field of computer science. As, under, as an undergraduate at Cambridge, Turing took a course in logic during his doings, which he learned about the Ensidung problem. He decided to focus on it as part of his graduate research having become convinced that, he, that Hibbert was wrong. Remember the Ensidung's problem or decision problem, also whether it's always possible to find a step-by-step -step procedure and algorithm to decide in the finite amount of time. If a given mathematical statement is true or not, if, if, a, mathematical, if a given mathematical statement is true or not, Hibbert strongly suspected that it was but he had no proof. Obviously, there are a lot, there are a lot of possible mathematical statements you could make. In fact, infinitely many, infinitely many. So there's no chance of writing an algorithm to check everyone, everyone individually, to see if it ends in the true or false answer. What was needed? Turing released was some general way of implementing algorithms. Then he could perhaps put the, put the decision problem to the test. He came up with the idea of a device that could carry out an illogical set of instructions that was given to it. Although he called this device a, an A machine, A for automatic, other quickly began to refer to it after its inventor. Turing never intended that his machine should actually be built. It was meant as a purely abstract thing, no more than, no more than a mathematical model of computing machine made from the simplest components. A Turing machine consists of just red, of just a red or right head and an infin infinitely long tape divided into squares, onto each of, of which can be written as A1 or A0, or, we, or which can be left blank. The head scans one square that at the time it carries out an action based on the head's internal state, the context of the square, and the current instruction in its logbook and program. The current instruction might be, for instance, if you are in, if you are in state 12, and the square you're looking at contains a 1 and then change it to a 0 and move the tab 1 square the tab 1 square to the left and switch into the state 23 on the machine tab at the first it's at the as on the machine tab at the start is its input in the form of series of ones and zeros the right or right, the, the right or right head is positioned over the first square of the input, say the leftmost, and follow the first instruction that it's been given. Gradually, it works its way through the instruction list on a program, transforming the initial string of ones and zeros on the tape into a different string until eventually it comes to a halt. When the machine reaches when the machine reaches this final state, what's left on the tape is the output.
one of the simplest and most useless tasks you could give a Turing machine would be add will be to add one more to a row of ones. The input will be the existing string of ones followed by black square. The first instruction will tell the will tell the read or write head to start at the first non-blank square and read what was on the square there. If it were a one, the instruction would be to leave it unchanged and move one square to the right while remaining in the same grid. If it were a blank, the instruction would be to write a one in that square in the square and stop. If the head uh, if the head had advanced to the to the next square, the instruction would be repeated and then again and again until the head finally reached a blank and replaced it by a one. Having added a one to a, to the string, the head might be taught to stop where it was or return to the start, possibly to repeat the whole process again and add one more and add one more to the total. Alternatively, a different state could be introduced when the red or right head is positioned at, at the final at the final one and a new program of actions continued from there. Some tasks give some tasks given a given to a Turing machine might cause it to go to go on for forever. For example, if you instruct a Turing machine always to move its right of its red or right head to the right after each step, no matter what is on the current step of the current square, it will be it will never stop. And it's easy to see in advance that this is the case. The kind of Turing machine we've just been talking about we might think of as the common of a garden variety. This, there are lots of different ways to, to specify this normal type, many of which turn out to be equivalent and some that don't. This is the first type of the Turing machine considered. She then went on to describe a special computational model that is now referred to as a universal Turing machine. In this, the tab has two distinct parts. One part encoded encodes the program as a string of ones and zeros, while the other while the other holds the input data. The red or right head of a universal Turing machine moves between these parts, carries out the program's instructions on the input, and writes down the output. That's all there is to it. An infinite an infinitely long tape that holds both the program to be run at the input output and a right and a red or red hat right hat. A, a universal Turing machine can perform just six basic operations red, right, move left, move right, change state and stop. Yet despite the simplicity it's astonishing astonish, astonishingly capable. By capable we mean we mean its potential to compute not superficial qualities such as speed or ease to of use. The fact is, a universal Turing machine, primitive though it may appear, can do everything that any real computer in any real computer in existence, including any laptop, desktop, mobile device, or, or large scale computer can do. With a simple though, in theory, infinite long, tap and dry, tap and read write height, it can replicate every computation comp possible on the world's more powerful comp supercomputer. Moreover, it can match anything which any co any conceivable computer in the future in the future, including so exotica exotica as quantum computers, will be able to do. Quite simply, it can run any possible program. This may seem surprising. After all, computers in the real world vary enormously. To take an obvious example, different mix of computers run different operating systems such as Windows, Android, Mac OS, and Linux. Each of these systems has its own unique features and, users and user interface. From a mathematical standpoint, however, they are all the same, all in fact are equivalent to a universal Turing machine. 
the equivalent the equi this equivalence leads to the concept of emulation one computer can emulate or precisely mimic another if it can run a program that for an ex operation of view effectively turns it into that computer for example a computer running windows can execute a program that makes it behave as if it were running mac os it may not do it very efficiently because it would use a lot of memory and call for a lot of processing but it could do it by the same token for the right program and the computer if we suppose it to have an unlimited amount of memory can be made to emulate a specific Turing machine including a universal Turing machine the bottom line is that all real computers and operating systems are mathematically equivalent to a universal Turing machine and therefore to each other assuming no memory restrictions now as we've said Turing purpose in coming up in, in coming up with his theoretical machine his general model of computation had nothing to do with building an actual computer his goal was to solve Hilbert's decision problem a universal Turing machine may or may not a universal Turing machine may or may not step may not stop given a specific a specific input we've already we of we've already looked at, this, at an example of each possibility when a Turing machine as an adds a one to an existing finish string of once and then stop and then stops and work it writes once for, for forever in these cases it's obvious ahead of time what will happen but Turing's equi but Turing's equi equations but Turing's question was this is it always possible in the case of any mathematical problem to determine in advance whether the computation will ever come to an end for obvious reasons this became known as the halting problem of course if you if you weren't sure if a certain program would ever terminate you would just let it run and run and see what happened but if it went on for a long time and you chose to give up at a certain point you'd never know whether the talking machine was going to stop right after that after that point or later on or whether it would carry on forever doing case by case evaluations like this would would prove uh, nothing. This genius of Turing, this genius of Turing, was to describe his computing machine in precise mathematical terms, and then and then ask if there was a general algorithm that could decide that the outcome, whether the machine stops or not for all inputs. In 1936, in a paper titled "On Computer On Computable Numbers with an Application to the Ensign Problem." He proved that no such algorithm exists. He then went on, the, on to show in the final part of his paper that this implies that the inciting problems can be solved. Can be solved. In fact, in, in fact, he he wasn't the first to do this. A month before Turing's landmark paper appeared to imprint, American logician Alonso Church independently published a paper that reached the same conclusion but using a completely different approach called lambda calculus because what church and Turing thought around the same time the general solution to the inciting problem is impossible the result the result is often referred to as the church church Turing thesis there are various ways of expressing this 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 gist, the gist of it however is that possible is that it's possible to calculate or evaluate something only if it's computable by a Turing machine or device that's equivalent to a Turing machine. This is an important conclusion when it comes to our particular quest for bigger and bigger numbers. It means that although there, although there may be many enormous numbers that are computable by ultimate means of computations of computation. A Turing machine, there are also numbers that are non computable. How can there be a numbers? How can there be numbers which we can define and know the thesis but, but that are but that are 
unreachable by any method of, of counting or computation now or in the future before we can answer that we need to finish exploring what's the comp what's computable which means staying a while longer within the rim of the Turing machine we've said the ordinary computers such as the laptops on which this book is being written as Turing machines in every way that matters mathematically but there are also but there are also other things that are referring to Turing machines but that but, be, but that bear no sufficient resemblance to their to them because they do not seem to be doing any computations at all one of these three machines in this case in the, is the game of life the device by john conway whom we've already encountered in connection with chain around notation <laughs> the game of life was a random idea that pop that pop into Conway's mind one day, but instead a development of work first done by Hungarian mathematician, by Hungarian American mathematician and physicist John von Neumann and Polish scientist Stanislaw Ulam. We'll be hearing more about von Neumann later because of his pivotal contributions to exploring the limits of maths and what's impossible to compute. As early as 1940, for, for Neumann was thinking about how the fundamentals of, a la of life as we know it might be recreated inorganically and possibly simulated by a Turing machine. Ulam came up with cellular automata as a way of experimenting with von Neumann's computational theories of life. A cellular automata is just a grid of cells, each of which can be in, can be in an in infinite number of states. In theory, it could extend to could it, it could extend in two, three or more dimensions and involve many different possible states. But this uses cellular automata to deal with concept of just to the array of squares and two possible states per, per square on or off. The starting pattern is then allowed to the fourth to evolve according to a set of rules that de that's decided in advance. For Neumann himself, God involved the design designing cellular automata that might one day serve as the base of our artificial forms of life built from the electromagnetic components. He was particularly interested in whether a hypothetical machine could be contrived that could make exact copies of itself. For Neumann found that it could be creating a mathematical model for such a machine using very complicated rules on a rectangle grid. But at the time, he was also busy with a lot of other works, of other work, including the Manhattan Project. So his efforts in his direction were incomplete. Three decades, three decades later, Conway wondered if there was a easier way of proving the same result, the ability to self-replicate and hit upon incredibly simple yet fascinating cellular automaton that he called life. The universe of Conway life is, in theory, an infinite two-dimensional grid of square, square cells, each of which can be either dead or alive. You can easily play a limited vision of it on a sheet of paper marked into squares, with contrast to represent squares that are alive. The game starts out with a particular pattern of life cells and then proceeds in discrete time steps. At each step, the new state of every cell is determined by the existing state of its immediate neighbors. The rulers are stay for what? A living cell with fewer than two life neighbors or more than three life neighbors dies. A living cell with two or three life neighbors survives. A dead cell with exactly three life neighbors comes alive. Although simple, these rulers were carefully chosen by Conway so that patterns of cells tend to evolve in interesting and unpredictable, say, in uh, unpredictable ways, neither going explosively fast nor dying, dying or too quickly.
Con West Remarkable Game was first brought to, uh, to the attention of the wider world to Martin Gardner Mathematical Gard Games column in the October 19, 1970 edition of Scientific American. Gardner introduced his reader to some of the some of which some of the basic pattern of life such as the blocks the block a single two by two black rectangle which under the rules of the game never changes and the blinker a one by three black rectangle which alternates between two states one horizontal and the other vertical keeping a fixed center the glider in a in a five unit shape that moves diagonally by a distance of one square every four turns Conway originally thought that no starting pattern would grow indefinitely that all patterns would eventually reach some stable or oscillating state or die out to altogether. In Gartner's 1970 art article on the game, Conway is a challenge with a 50 cent reward for the first person 50 with a $50, 50 dollar reward for the first person who could either prove or disprove this conjecture. Within weeks, the prize had been claimed by a team from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, led by mathematician and programmer Bill Gosberg, one of the founders of the hacker community. The so-called Gosberg leader gun, as part of its endless repetitive activity, spits out spits out a steady stream of leaders at the rate of one per thirty time steps of of generations. Of generations. Combinations of Gosberg leader guns, it turns out, can simulate the logic gates that form the basics of computers. A stream of leaders issuing from one of these guns can represent a high signal of a one in binary arithmetic and an absence of, of leader a low signal or a zero. Other leader can block another because if two leaders meet in the right way, they annihilate each other. There's also something called an enter and either, which is a simple configuration of seven life size cells. An either can have such excess gliders, thereby preventing them from disrupting other parts of the pattern, which it which while itself remains unchanged. Certain configurations of Cosper leaders clan leaders leader guns and either are all it takes to simulate the basic logic gets at the heart of a general purpose computer or more to the point the computational ability of a universal Turing machine there is nothing that even the world's more powerful multi-million pound supercomputer can do that given enough time and ingenuity can be computer using the game of life furthermore because life can be set up to perform a universal Turing machine, it's also impossible to write a program that can predict the ultimate fate of uh, of any arbitrary of arbitrary life pattern. As such a program, as such a program, will then be able to solve the halting problem. A Turing and charge, a Turing and charge proof. There's no way of determining an advance in every circumstance, whether a given program with heart or not. However, this raises another question. Can we limit what the program is capable of in order to guarantee that it terminates in most programming languages? There's one way to do this easily by ensuring the program has no loops. Then, a uh, program runs from start to finish, it guaranteed to stop at the end. However, in all particular cases, for larger and larger numbers, this restriction is extremely limiting. Even basic, basic, even basic tasks, such as raising a number to a power, generally requires some sort of loop to perform a repeated fraction, like the like multiplication efficiently. You could try copying the same line of code over and over again to multiply repeatedly, and doing so may in doing so may allow you to reach the Google, but it becomes a hopeless mission, certainly in practical terms, to get to Google text this way, not to mention all the numbers that are far greater still. Is there, 
is the then a better name at the weather a better way which will also face the Google Plex with allowing programs that may never end. As we saw in the last chapter, one option is to allow only for loops. They, this may take the form, for instance, carry out a series of instructions for n from 1 to the 100. Such a loop will repeat exactly 100 times. At even time, the value of n will increment by 1, starting at 1 and ending at 100. If we only use these pro loops in any program and for any other type of regression, it's possible to prove that every such program takes minutes. The reason for this is that an individual loop can repeat, it, repeat only a finite amount of times. So in the case above, you could replace for the loop with 100 copies of its code with and replaced by the appropriate number in each sum, in each one, in, in, the, in each one. Sometimes, a f sometimes a full loop might say from n from 1 to m or m in some other number that program has previously calculated. In this case, the problem would run up that to that point in order to figure, to ex figure out exactly how many copies are needed. If only for loops are permitted, then as I saw earlier, the functions we can compute are known as primitive recursive. Primitive recursive functions are, are, are a lot more powerful than no recursive functions. For instance, it's easy to go to compute the Google Plex in this way. First multiply 10 by itself 100 times to get the Google, then multiply 10 by itself a Google times to get the Google Plex. But the, but the power doesn't end here. But the power doesn't end here. If, if you have a function that accepts some input, it's possible to fit that input back into, its, back into itself literally many times. So we can build the function of, of exponentiation with a for loop feeding the result of our multiplication back into itself. But the two power becomes apparent when you notice that exponent becomes the number of times the of times the for loop repeats. We can again fit this back into itself with another with another for loop resulting in each repeat of the other loop creating a massive increase increase in the number of times the in the inner loop repeats. We can first calculate the Google Plex, then raise that to Google Plex the power and raise ten to the to that imaginable power and so on a Google time a Google Plex times. This brings us to attention. Using a third loop, using a third for loop gives us pentition and so on. Okay. Can be calculated using only a primitive recursion. But there are limits but there are limits to to what you can do with primitive recursion functions. You may try to reach Graham's number, but you will inevitably fail. You will you won't even get close, even G2 will be your, your grasp. So clearly, if you want to make tremendously large numbers and surpass Graham's number, primitive recursion is not the way. So far, we've tried to limit our programs to avoid impossibility to an endless loop. But what if we use the full capacity of our programs? But what if we use the full capacity of our programs? If we allow any program, no matter how complicated it loops, provided it never loops forever, is there a limit to how large the numbers can get? It turns out that there's still a fundamental limit going back to the halting problem itself. Before we can understand this limit, however, we have to venture into a very strange land indeed. indeed. We have to enter a room beyond definite.